All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good, to, good to see you here. Uh, my name is Will Inboden. I'm honored to be the uh, Executive Director of the Clement Center for National Security, one of your two host institutions for today's talk, along with the uh, Strauss Center for International Security at Law. Um, and uh, the, well, the woman I'm about to introduce is the uh, latest speaker in our Women in National Security Speaker Series. Uh, where we are uh, looking to highlight women who have uh, made considerable accomplishments in the, nat in the national security field across a range, range of domains. Uh, so Mary Beth Long, who will be hearing from in a moment, uh, started off her career with the uh, CIA's Director of Operations. Uh, did that for a number of years before moving over to the, uh, the, the policy realm, uh, depending on where she was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, and became the first ever uh, woman to be Senate confirmed for Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. And those of you who may know the Pentagon knows that that is the, really the first among equals among Assistant Secretaries of Defense. Uh, so she, um, at the end of the uh, George W. Bush administration in which she served, she then founded three different companies and continues to be the CEO of those three companies. Uh, uh, she's pretty much traveling constantly between the U.S. and the Middle East and other points beyond. So we are very thankful that she was able to make a little detour to our humble corner of the universe here in Austin, Texas. So uh, Mary Beth is going to be speaking on the Middle East and terrorist financing. And uh, so uh, please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Once again, um, the administration is busy, of course, countering 
uh, potential attacks in various realms, particularly with our borders being as open as they are. So the idea of you know trying to build the wall, either figuratively or literally, and keeping somebody else's problem on their turf is, is just not realistic. And it's much more complicated, as all of you know, because you're studying this, um, than people realize. But it, it's worth mentioning. First of all, the Middle East again, this is sort of the, when I talk about the Middle East, I talk about it broadly. Foreign policy concerns, and here I'm just going to talk about the big ones that seep across our border. You'll hear people talking about hybrid threats, transnational threats, global uh, threats. Um, these are all different ways for people to describe really what is the shift in the last decades from nation states being the primary occupiers of the ground where you would have weapons of mass destruction and the ability to engage war. That has now expanded beyond the nation state structure to non-nation states. Hezbollah, uh, some would argue, has more missile capability than many of the Middle Eastern states. So when I talk about ISIS and violent extremists and foreign policy concerns that are non-state specific, these are the transnational threats, the things that have a home but tend to morph back and forth across what we consider geographic borders. We also have um, the dovetailed issue of oil prices and the way that those have an impact on the threats, not only from a, a, a traditional threat perspective, terrorism and terrorism financing, but also the state's ability to deal with it when they're suffering budgetary issues or when oil actually becomes part of either the infrastructure that a terrorist organization relies upon and adopts, or um, a deal between nation states um, to sort of set the groundwork of who's going to get bombed next as the local terrorist. Is it the Kurds? Is it the Peshmerga? Is it ISIS? Is it who? And that has everything to do with oil and gas and cross-border uh, trade or barter. Nuclear negotiations and weapon proliferation, again, uh, used to be state-owned, not so much anymore, particularly with, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Daesh having had access or gained access in some of the Muslim universities to um, either uh, enriched uranium or fissile mater uh, materials, some would argue, certainly chemical and biological weapons that used to just be uh, the proprietary um, interests of states. The breakdown of the nation states and the border. Um, I happen to be one of the people that believes that one of the things that we're seeing happen is that it's the disintegration of the post-World War II, 1950s, 60s geographic states. Again, part of it's just a practical matter. You've got a lot of stuff, trade, communications, personal relationships, families, the internet, that just aren't confined by borders anymore. Um, so that there's a, there's a false sense of security with geographic borders. And then, frankly, the geographic borders that we're all accustomed to, most of which were fairly arbitrarily, um, I think people would argue, driven by post-World War II political considerations, not involving the local players, but they're definitely framed. And I think we're going to see in the next generation that those really becoming, in some senses, either totally frayed or, or inconsequential in a lot of respects. Then you have... Um, Uncertain political futures, both individually and collectively. What is the role of the GCC in the Arab League? Uh, you see a little bit of a morph uh, recently in the paper. Are they going to have a, a, a unity government, some kind of military capability between or among themselves? Um, don't know. Is Turkey going to become part of the EU? Why is that important? Um, is Turkey going to continue to be part of NATO? Why is that important? Um, you have key states that have a tenuous hold on their leadership. Some would argue that the best thing since Mubarak is uh, Sisi, and that Sisi has done a fairly good job at addressing at least popular um, discontent with where uh, Egypt fell on the democracy um, line. But is that going to work? What about Egypt's economy? Egypt is by far the most popular Arab country. Um, what do you do with the tens of millions of people in Egypt if in two years CC can't feed them. Uh, they don't have access to potable water and there's no real economy. There's only so much money that all these can pour into Egypt that you even end up with an absorption problem. What about Saudi Arabia? Uh, what is that next you going to look at? Who's it going to be? Is it going to be the deputy crown prince? Is it going to be the crown prince? And what does that bode for the King Abdullah type um, Saudi Arabia that we've all come to know? 
um, what's going to happen with um, the Sultanate of Oman? The Sultanate of where? Important. Why? Because they're the stickler in the GCC that they don't agree with doing anything with anybody and they're always the Oman will never go for this vote. Um, but that's under uh, Sultan Qaboos, who is quite old and doesn't have a successor. And that the, the successor formula is opaque even to Omanis. And of course you've got Oman, terribly afraid of the crossed Gulf uh, neighbor Iran, with a significant trading relationship with them. Um, so how is that going to swing and will it, what, what repercussions will it have for U.S. forces there and for navigable straits and for the GCC? Um, important questions. And then, of course, immigration. Why immigration? Because it has morphed from something that people used to be able to count from across the border, collect a tax, maybe even have a commerce guy involved, see what you brought in and brought out, to something virtually uncontrollable in parts of the Middle East and under lockdown in other parts. Um, and you'll hear the debate why aren't the Middle Eastern countries taking more Syrian refugees? You'll hear allegations that Turkey is actually facilitating. Uh, Afghan and Syrian refugees from going into uh, Europe, particularly to Greece, um, in order to poke their Greek brother in the eye, or that Syria um, refugees have become a pawn for Turkey to basically blackmail the rest of the EU, EU for giving lots of money for keeping them in Turkey. Uh, meanwhile, while Turkey fights uh, the Syrian Kurds, um, as well as at least often uh, back and forth. Rocky curves. Um, so immigration and who gets access to what states and under what circumstances, particularly out of northern Africa, is, is going to be a real issue. And, and with that, I'll put a slash and put demographics. Um, demographics for the Middle East is a national security and international strategy concern. 25 and younger. Some 60% of Libya is aged 25 and younger. They barely remember anything prior to Gaddafi. Um, I think in Saudi Arabia, and I, I may be slightly wrong on the statistics, I think uh, some 73% of the population is 30 and younger. Um, and when you look at the jobs and, and activities that we would consider to be activities that allow you to participate in a productive way in a society, they are few and far between and getting fewer. What do you do with a population that's fairly well ed educated, much more connected to the rest of the world than your generation was, just via social media, that is one of the highest per capita users of social media in the world, doesn't have a job, and stuck in a society where arguably the constraints are unparalleled as far as what your social and religious and other mobility within that society is. Um, and, and, and what do you do with that? And how does that shape the way Saudi Arabia approaches its relationship with us and its national security concerns? Uh, that's just one. Then, of course, there are state-specific concerns. As if that weren't enough, if we went state by state, you know, the, the <coughs> list of horribles, I'm sure you know most about, but spend a little bit of time on that. Um, and then the idea that, although you could probably come out of here wanting to put yourself in the eye with a pencil, I tend to look at the problems, but there are opportunities here. Um, as a matter of fact, I think one of them just to throw out is as a result of Syria and as a result of um, ISIS, you do have um, Middle Eastern countries by and large looking more towards the U.S. for leadership and for guidance and to be part of a coalition and to be part of the solution uh, overtly than they ever have before. And rather than this being something that was fairly elite held at the governmental levels, this is seeping down and is, is actually talked about in society, in their own newspapers. So the Arab street is becoming more self-aware of their government's role with the U.S. and others. Um, on the flip side, there's the vacuum problem where you have Russia taking advantage of that, and, and some would argue China taking advantage of the, the lack of U.S. leadership and meaningful participation. But it, there are opportunities there. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them because why spend time on happy talk when there's so much disaster? <laughs> okay. Middle East. <coughs> 
again, everybody knows their map. When I talk about it, I tend to start at least at Libya, swing down through Egypt, Egypt being one of the three stools of the Middle East or the Islamic um, uh, stool. Egypt, because of historical reasons, this is also where most um, trained academicians or linguists or scholars of Islam were formally trained. They still go to Egyptian universities. So Egypt, one part of the stool. Saudi Arabia, the other. Um, in part because of geographics. The other part is, you know, everybody, when you buy a piece of property, they say, you know, location, 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 you know, Mecca and Medina and the traditional um, homelands of the prophets. Um, and then up through Iraq, not foundational, but for the Shia, uh, similar emphasis on traditional uh, cities and uh, culture that are intrinsic to um, the role of the prophet and his family in, in Shia. Syria, I hope no one expects me to spend much time on Syria. We read it in the paper and we know what's going on. Syria, um, I think arguably right now, doesn't really even exist as a state and may not. Um, for the next couple of years, I don't, and I don't think that's a tough call on my part. Um, Jordan, probably for me, um, one of the key, key points of the Middle East that very few people talk about, uh, in part because we're so used to the Heshemite and the royal family having a fairly firm grip, but uh, if you talk to an Israeli, um, either intelligence or military, they will tell you that our, our first and foremost, most important ally is Jordan. Jordan keeps the terrorists at bay. Jordan keeps us afloat. Um, there are seats up here, and I promise I won't, I won't hit you. <laughs> um, Jordan, again, uh, huge problems, part of which uh, we are complicit in, in my, in my book, which is just absolutely overwhelmed with Iraqi uh, immigrants, uh, arguing whether it's a million or more, um, that are severe strain, not only on schools, and infrastructure and society and jobs, but uh, on, on basics like water. And also dealing with now, um, at somewhere between, depending on who you speak to, some 600,000 to almost a million Syrian refugees um, who are further exacerbating a really resource-stretched um, country. Had it not been for the public execution of the Jordanian pilot, um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, that was a, a sea-changing moment for a lot of the Middle East, but particularly for Jordan. Um, there was real skepticism about the, uh, some of the tribes who felt that they weren't participants in either economic um, benefits um, or they, they, they weren't making it into the middle class and that they weren't part of the, either the familial role or the Heshemite clan. Um, we were, we we're very possibly going the other way. And if there was one seminal moment where it flipped, it was uh, the, the country rallying around the disgusting um, portrayal of the live burning of the Jordanian pilot. Um, not forgotten, um, but uh, I think we're starting to see a little bit of creeping away again where um, some are asking a very real question, what can Jordan do? And how is it now, for the last three decades, we've ended up being the recipient of all the quote-unquote trash of everybody else's conflict? And why is it, you know, we're sort of the cheese stands alone here. Um, we can have a long conversation about that. Jordan, of course, very, very integral what's going on in the, the, the Palestinians and Israel um, and Hamas and Gaza, however you want to characterize it. Um, for the first time, uh, interestingly, the Israelis will also tell you that their relations with Egypt as to tunnel building and protection of the Sinai never before better. Uh, they've become very close to the Egyptians, where they even speak kindly of one another uh, publicly and have exchanges um, uh, not formal, but certainly not unknown with their intelligence organizations to try to cut off the tunnels not only into Israel, um, but also into Gaza. Why? Is it, did, did CC wake up with a change of heart? No, no, Muslim Brotherhood links and making sure that um, that, that, that doesn't creeping back in. Um, so there's a mutual coincidence of interest, not exactly the same interest. Um, Syria we talked about. Turkey uh, we talked about. Complex. Erdogan. Uh, is he a reformist? No. Is he interested in um, 
was he interested in being uh, one of the pillars of Islam to rival um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, particularly when Egypt was suffering under the Muslim Brotherhood? In my opinion, yes. Is he um, is he a, um, a a bastion of sectarian um, or de democracy building? No. And I think we're just beginning to see the Erdogan that um, some uh, would have warned the president before you say this is your most valued international relationship. You ought to slow down, buddy, because this gentleman is never going to voluntarily leave power. And he almost got cremated in elections and then, and then broke the peace treaty with the Kurds in Iraq in order to flame national fire so that his party could remain in power and is now um, arguably the bane of NATO's existence um, using his strategic location and some of his ability to take on uh, refugees um, to uh, be paid off by European countries who want to keep uh, immigrants and Islamists from coming out of Turkey into the rest of the border. We can talk about that at that point. Um, of course, that slops over into um, Afghanistan, Armenia, Turkmenistan, and over to the other side through Iran. Iran, the big boogeyman. Uh, on the one hand, you have um, uh, sentiments that are represented by the president's statement. Hey, look, the fact of the matter is size does matter. Uh, and it definitely matters in the Middle East. And when you look at the Gulfies and you look at realistically where um, power is going to be located, it is Egypt because of the numbers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and everybody else is sort of a, the B team. So Saudi Arabia, as most of you are aware, the president said, you just, just really got to get used to sharing the Middle East with the Persians. Um, he said the Iranians, everybody in the Middle East heard Persians, um, those who are um, thinking secondary for Shia. Um, so, you know, one big thing in, the, in international relations and, and intelligence and all, no matter what you say, you have to think hard about who your audience is and what they hear. Um, the president's statement certainly could have been uh, couched as a recognition of the politique. Um, I think Kissinger would have said it differently, but what the Middle East heard was, we knew that you were going to strike this deal no matter what, um, but we gave you the benefit of the doubt when we went to Camp David, and we saw that you were going to strike the nuclear deal, and, and we knew that you needed to buy us off so that we didn't side with the Republicans and get it stopped in Congress. So you made us promises about if the nuclear deal goes, you will put strict, enforceable, and enforced restrictions on Iran's other bad behavior, and constant calls for Bahrain uh, to regain its role as a province of Persia of Iran <coughs> and meddling in internal Bahraini politics. The support to the Houthis. Um, and we can all argue about whether that's um, more Houthi or more Iranian. Meddling along um, our borders, uh, the, the fast boats harassing our ships, um, the incursions into our uh, naval or maritime spaces, um, the bomb plots that we have uh, uh, heard about, a perfect example of a plot supposedly to bomb the Saudi ambassador in the United States at Cap in Milan. It was just one of the more recent examples. Um, them basically being, uh, make, turning Iraq into a surrogate state, uh, them, uh, you know, yada, 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 of which uh, the missile development program, testing of the missiles, and um, now the realization, or at least the view that we've reneged on all of that. Um, and then you have the president coming out with a statement. I think he wanted to be interpreted uh, one way and being heard, at least by our allies, as being something very different. Um, and what do you do about that? Um, then, for those of you who are not familiar with the Gulf, uh, just quickly, you've got Qatar, uh, Kuwait, which we always keep over. And, uh, actually, most Kuwaitis do too. Um, the Kuwait government uh, being uh, barely in place, I think they've shut themselves down you know, one ministry or the other. I don't know, I've actually lost track how many times in the last couple of years. Basically a non-effective uh, 
um, government is having a very difficult time, you know, fighting his own way out of the paper bag. Um, Qatar, Qatar, of course, uh, views itself as the objective country, the place where the Taliban can have an office and talk to the Americans and talk to the Afghans. Uh, the home of Al Jazeera, which actually wasn't designed to irritate the Americans and the Israelis, which it did, but actually founded and designed to irritate the Saudis. There's a long history there. Uh, Qatar, new emir, um, favored son of Sheikha Musa, a very powerful Middle Eastern woman by everyone's count. She's amazing. I know that she's been to UT. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Secretary Gates and I used to share stories about of what an amazing force of power she is. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, a um, very recently stitched together uh, country of a, a number of uh, smaller emirates, very powerful, um, only 45-ish years old. Uh, the federal government is run by Abu Dhabi. Uh, most of the trade and the other economic power in Dubai. Um, the little Sparta uh, that you'll hear about when uh, US military will talk. Um, really has uh, stood out as deploying with U.S. forces, I think, in every conflict that we've engaged in for the last 15 years. I may have missed one, but I don't think so. Generally, quietly, and now going through a real um, self-search um, and trying to figure out whether they stick with uh, the gringos or whether they need to hedge their bets and find their own path. I don't think you would hear them say that publicly. Oman, again, key role. Muscats and the Straits, this is the choke point that everybody worries about principally when we talk about um, freedom of navigation, oil and gas. There's actually a big old natural gas we have to sit under the Arabian Gulf for the Gulf. I would strike out the Persian on this one just to make sure I didn't offend my, my Arab allies. Um, uh, actually, Qatar in Iran co owned a, a natural gas field, one of the largest found, and sits underneath this part of the Gulf, uh, which is one of the reasons why when you, when you think about Qatar, at the end of the day, their their politics and their national security are, are complicated by the fact that they're very well aware that's the future of, um, of where they're going uh, petroleum-wise, and, and that is not going to change. And of course, our, our most recent basket case, Yemen. I've been to Yemen on vacation several times. I'm probably that in Libya, um, even recently, and I think people think I'm insane, but if you ever get the inclination, um, they are life-changing experiences and that you learn so much. Um, Yemen, probably a country that never really was. Uh, for those of you who are as old as I am, you can remember how in the 80s you had North Yemen and South Yemen. They sort of came together um, at one point and are now um, Probably they've been a basket case as far as central rule, as far as providing a minimal support to the people. Um, uh, they've got a, a water problem that probably is, if not the worst, one of the worst in the world, and they use a lot of it for cut, um, which is a very interesting social um, product that uh, most of the afternoon, if you go visit someone, you'll end up drinking tea and chewing cut and having a, a, a conversation. It's, it's, I suppose it's classified as a narcotic, I don't know. But it's a little bit like drinking your afternoon coffee on steroids. Um, and it makes you understand why not a lot gets done. <laughs> <coughs> Interestingly, most of our Gulf brethren um, are very involved in what's happening in Sudan. That's why I purposely chose this map. And Somalia, um, because of relationships um, that they fear um, with Boko Haram um, and the, um, what's the terrorist organization in Somalia? Al Thank you, Al Shabaab. Uh, very, very uh, interested in both. Uh, pessimists would argue it's because Sudan and Somalia have resources um, that if you were an Arab country and you were worried about blowing through your petroleum and gas and you realized you didn't have much else that you would explore countries that do. Um, awful lot of land purchasing uh, by the Arab countries, uh, mostly Sunna in, in um, all of these countries where they're growing crops, uh, manufacturing, and uh, mineral and other exploration. So there's the Middle East. I barely even touched on 
what I would consider sort of bit players, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. You can't talk about Afghanistan and Pakistan without talking about India, but that's probably a bridge too far. Here's a quick look at northern, uh, northern Africa. Most of the Maghreb, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. Some populations in Sudan um, consider themselves part of the Middle East, or certainly Arab, or large sectors of the populations do. A phenomenal amount of decision making by the GCC members, particularly the UAE and Saudi Arabia, keep Morocco in mind. Very, very close relationships. Um, same with Libya. Um, after the coalition, coalition um, left Libya and um, Muammar Gaddafi ceased to exist, um, the Qataris and the Emiratis remained um, and physically as well as they are now um, and have been supporting different factions and different militia. So part of the reason the Tripoli versus Maserata versus who's got the oil fields, etc., has been um, because you've got Arab countries and other meddling going on in Libya. Um, not so sure that there's surrogacy wars, but there's definitely some meddling. I, and people say, oh, that's not true. And I can tell them I personally was walking in to see the Minister of Defense in Libya in 2014 in Tripoli and ran into, physically ran into, as I turned the corner, Hamid al who was the chief of staff of the Qatari um, military and who is now advisor to the Emir on state security, and said, Hamid, what are you doing here? Hamid <laughs> uh, said, Mary, I thought you were out of government. <laughs> so um, lots of, lots of uh, repercussions. Uh, same with Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, uh, heads up. Uh, you're going to see a little bit of conversation going on here. Uh, some would argue the Arab coalitions are building bases here uh, in order to continue to prosecute the war or the stability. I think we're going to quickly see a declaration of victory and stability in Yemen because everybody's realized uh, this is a sucking sound and we can't continue to do this. So we're going to do a NATO. And for those of you who are NATO fans, uh, please forgive me. We're going, to do, we're going to do a NATO, just declare victory, and leave. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and at least there are just lots of talk in the GCC about moving uh, at least forward operating bases here in order to maintain the stability. Why here? Um, some real fears that if they do it from their own, there will be repercussions, and also um, most of them made decisions years ago to have the Americans and the French and the Brits on their bases, and there's a bit of seeking of privacy. Afghanistan and Pakistan, just want to talk about it a little bit because it has the implications, of course, for what Russia is up to, for what Iran is up to, and as you know, the U.S. is still in um, Afghanistan, and our force posture is up somewhat for debate. Um, we still have uh, Arab allies who are deployed with us in Afghanistan, although that has trickled down and through. And lots of talk now about what Pakistan role is going to be vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese and vis-a-vis -vis the Saudis. Saudi's Navy is traditionally based on long historic ties with the Pakistan Navy. Um, and that has led some people to think that if uh, Saudi Arabia is going to become a nuclear weapon country that they will buy or have bought um, from, uh, are you guys aware of the Khan network? Okay, so contributing to the conflicts. So you've got this mess. Um, there's a lot of explanations for it. None of them are, um, all of them are necessary, I would say, but none of them are sufficient. So I'm just going to quickly go through this slide. I'm pretty sure you know all of this. So what's contributing to normal conflicts and the normal level of conflicts? Well, the first one is there's a breakdown of, of traditional states from a geographic standpoint. Um, you know, Iraq, some would argue, has been underway for a while. Yemen, some would argue, has uh, really never had a, a solid geographic um, baseline. Uh, many would argue that Syria um, probably has crossed the Rubicon, so to speak, and will never be, or certainly not in, in the short term of our lifetimes, a truly operating state. 
um, that the best thing we'll, we'll come up with is maybe an Alawite or a Bashar Assad remnants controlled section, a section that will be al Nusra in front, and some formulation of um, Islamist extremists. Uh, there'll be other places that no one cares about that will quietly break away or be uh, semi auto if it's independent. Uh, there'll be places where um, uh, some of the minorities may find a little niche effort. But one of the things that's going on sort of sub rosa um, in Syria that we don't talk a lot about that is going to have impact on that is what I believe is the genocide of um, all the other guys in Syria that uh, the Jewish community, for example, uh, has had a vibrant, vibrant role in Syria since the previous to the days of Christ and Muhammad. Um, old, 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 sort of pre-Orthodox Christian um, cultures and places, and those are, I think, all we've got. My Eastern, Eastern Orthodox friend who goes to Damascus all the time says there's maybe eight Jews now left in Syria. Um, same with the Christian uh, population, same with uh, several other minorities, just gone, um, having been uh, the victims of genocide. Who's in charge, even where there are great states that everybody says, okay, this isn't going anywhere, there's the, there's the big question of not really sure who's in control, and I'm not really sure who the decision maker is and whether he's going to be there for very long. Uh, the quintessential example is Egypt, uh, post Mubarak, we had a, a brief blush of Arab Spring. I hate the term. I actually think it's a term that's being used to explain a lot of things that are different, but because they're changed, we throw it into Arab Spring. But whatever whatever that was, um, and, and I don't want to short, uh, give short shift to what the Egyptian people did. They really did get out on the streets, and they really are looking for something different. And I think they really believe that the Muslim Brotherhood um, could have offered that to some extent. I also believe the reason was a Brotherhood well as they were only people who were organized at the time. Um, but, but will CC be that answer? Uh, many people would argue that you know, CC has neither the economic tools nor luck on his side when it comes to economics. And at the end of the day, I'm one of those people that think practically a lot of this is driven by economics. Um, will he be able to, to withstand, and, and many would argue with, with some basis that he's already starting to tighten up on the, the rights that many people thought they fought for and won, which is freedom of the press, freedom of association, um, freedom of uh, students to study and, and voice themselves, freedom of congregation. Um, so is, is Sissy going to be the strong man and can he will lead you together? Um, and of course, implicit in all of that is my assumption that um, do you need a strong man to hold each other together in some of these places? Um, I'll, I'll hold Obama on you and, and be unpolitic and say yes. Um, but I, I, I think there's a lot of basis in that particular in the And the Middle Easterns will tell you. Um, you know, the reasons why our monarchies should continue to survive is because we're your strong men. Um, we don't need democracy, and you don't understand democracy because what we actually have is our people have a, more of a voice than your people do. And here, let me explain it to you. It's complicated. Um, so, Arab Spring and changing expectations, changing expectations again driven by two things. Virtually every one of those countries that I'm talking about, the pillars of Islam, have a demographic nightmare coming down their way and it is going to explode where you're going to have a lot, millions, and in some cases in Egypt, tens of millions of fairly well educated individuals, kids, who have had access to the internet most of their adult life or their youthful life, who know what it's like out there, so their expectations are high. Um, they've had a fairly good opportunity to converse and exchange ideas with not only their, their current neighborhood, but other places, and they've got no jobs and no prospects for not only jobs, but for, for getting married, for moving outside the home, for starting their own family. There's nowhere to go. Um, and that's going to happen almost simultaneously in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and other places. And we are talking millions. And there's a really interesting study that I think Rand did, that if you look historically at nation states and when they go to war, that there's a correlation between um, unemployed males of fighting age. And at some point when you get over whatever, I, I don't recall what, the, what sort of the danger zone is, 
but at the point in which you get into the danger zone that you've got too many basic guys hanging out, not employed and not employable, that nations tend to go to conflict. And whether that's the result of testosterone or as a result of nations having to resort to nationalism and finding an enemy in order to get this population to stay behind the state and not and not become an opposition to the state, I don't know. There's an interesting correlation. And if you if you accept that, China is also on this. One of the unforeseen consequences of the uh, one child and the uh, female genocide. Sunni Shias in sectarian conflicts, you'll hear a lot about them. Uh, it does explain, in many respects, some of the underlying currents of some of the conflicts. My personal opinion is um, a lot of this are power conflicts that are draped in uh, religion, not, not to say that the individuals who participate aren't sincere about their religious commitment, uh, but uh, Middle East uh, politics and Middle East conflict is extremely driven by nationalism, tribalism, uh, religious, but also by power. And I, I chafe a little bit when I get up and hear somebody saying, well, this is all about Sunnah versus Shia. It is uh, in many respects, but it's also not. In, in fact, most people will tell you in the Middle East, uh, on, a, on, a, on a tribal level, on a village level, or in a city level, um, really for several decades, most of the capitals that are the power capitals had intermarriage. They had neighborhoods that were uh, not segregated, where Sunnah, Shia, and other coexisted without. And it's really been this inflaming of this religious distinction by uh, various groups some of which are truly religiously committed, others who are looking for power, others who are looking to um, basically control extremist freaks um, who have a worldview that they think should be imposed regardless of the religious arguments to the contrary. Uh, but it's important to know, um, probably I would write right up there that you have the Arab-Persian dynamic, which is equally as powerful and never to be underestimated. When you hear Arabs talk about Iran, you'll hear them really talking in many respects about Persians. Um, and then you have minorities. Um, one of the things that I think we can all say universally, that the Middle East conflicts right now are absolutely decimating minorities, whether it's the Yazidis in Iraq, whether it's Christians and Jews elsewhere, the minorities are being wiped out. Um, and shame on us in the West because we're not talking about it. We don't want to see it. I think in part because there's so much other things going on, but also if you see it and you know it, then you're, the next question is what are you going to do about it? And I think the answer is we don't know and we're not sure we can, so it sort of slides under. Although I will, um, for those of you who follow politics, I believe that Congress did pass the declaration of genocide against uh, at least Christians. Uh, and the state actually did make a declaration that it's genocide also. Okay. That, that was a fight in, in, in Washington. And then the fact that all of this, you know, yes, the Middle East has been a, a place of conflict and, and bubbling up. Um, so why is this different and why should I care? And you know, why, 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 why the crisis? Well, the crisis is because the, the, it has to do with a lot of things in the world. One is globalization, us all being interlinked. One of them is the fact that changes in everybody's societies are coming so fast. Changes in technology, changes in communication, <coughs> changes in the relationship between students and, and, um, and decision makers on guys who are developing the internet and the White House. Changes coming so fast that traditional steeped in history um, sort of slow moving cultures are having a real tough time dealing with it. When I went to Abu Dhabi in the 80s, there was one three-story building and um, no women driving. There was one road and it had roundabouts. In less than 40 years, they have built a city and a country that will not hear sockets off. It is more modern than New York in, in many respects. Um, it is, you can be Jewish and go into the mosque the National Mox uh, that commemorates Sheikh Zayed, the founder. Um, there are one slice of the Arab world that's trying to keep up and even get ahead. They're studying alternative energy. They're looking at totally green island building where they'll put their um, cities or their populations that will be self-sustainable um, with water desalinization 
and uh, other sources, non petroleum sources of energy. One small little phase. But their societies, not so much. You still have people arrested on the beach for making out in Dubai when the police feel like it. So there's this coexistence of old and new, and most of the Middle East is struggling um, to figure it out. And what's happening is the youth is moving much more quickly, and the guys in the robes and the veneration of tribal leaders and of age and of wisdom just, we have a big gap, and it, it's going to get bigger. So that's where changes are coming fast. You have new rivalries. New alliances? Who ever thought the GCC was actually going to talk seriously about uh, becoming and for having a military force? The whole idea of not having a military force that was Arab wide was you wouldn't have to worry about your neighbor's army coming over and just deposing you, and you kept your own army and military sort of weak because of tradition of everybody taking over through coups. So, this whole idea of building the militaries and even sharing or even cooperating, whew, big change. You've got, um, you've got new players, Hezbollah. Again, now with weapons that are war, uh, actually missiles, that uh, Jordan, for example, couldn't even begin to have. You've got terrorist groups that are actually establishing state or quasi-states in little, in little places that you actually consider to be your state. Um, so the two players have changed, the power has changed, and more importantly, the gap between what a state could do and what everybody else could do, whether it's trade, economics, Travel, communicate, instant, instant building of coalitions and ideas, exchange and building of um, of demonstrations and protests instantaneously in a society that used to control that up until very recently, very stringently, and now that's all collapsed. Um, tough to deal with, even even by us. Um, social media we talked about the have and the have nots. All of a sudden, people realize, gee, you know. There are a lot of people out there buying really cool stuff or having access to things that I would like to have access to. Entitlement and demographics we talked about, education and job. The snake in the grass. Immigration. I believe, and there are several of us studying this, and this is just the, the beginning of, of what are going to be a significant long-term immigration problem from North Africa, uh, stimulated by what is going to be um, continuing instability in Syria, and then also continuing instability in Libya, and continuing uh, unmet expectations in the African countries that are pushing uh, immigration basically across the Mediterranean at this point. But it's going to cause real issues and real changes in our European allies um, at a minimum, and it will cause uh, real changes in the way our allies, our traditional allies, have to operate in the Middle East. Um, if you look closely, Lebanon right now, another place we don't talk about, basically Lebanon is um, not too far from Yemen in that the government is, is not working. I don't think they had a prime minister for, it's been over a year. Um, that government is designed, in fact, to have um, different, uh, I don't want to say chapels, who's my Lebanon? Directions. Factions, but there's, a, there's actually a technical word. Confessionals. Um, confessionals, there we go. What I was like, uh, chapel, creeds, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so confessionals. Yes. Uh, designed to be divided up among the, um, the Druids, the Christians, yada, yada, yada. The confessionals are not, there's no crosstalk. It, it, basically, the government is non functional. Couldn't even pick up the garbage, which was a huge issue a couple of years ago. And they are really getting killed with Syrian refugees with no capacity to do anything about them, as well as fighting uh, using the Lebanese army. Same again with uh, Jordan. Again, Syrian refugees in Jordan, this is 630,000. I think most people would say it's well about that. Um, Jordan is a little teeny tiny country and hadn't gotten rid of all the Iraqis yet. Um, and, and it is going to be, a, I think of all the countries that everyone is worried about, Jordan is the most on the precipice just not being able to handle all of this external crap that's coming its way. Same thing with Turkey. We all know Turkey, some would say, exacerbated the, um, the, see this little guy's walking across, um, the situation by not closing its borders. Some would uh, somewhat persuasively argue that that decision was made 
so that everyone could have it both ways, complain about the immigrants, but also support the al Nusra fronts and others that were helping them kill the Syrian Kurds um, and the Syrian Kurdish movements that had always been a threat to him. So why not pinch those guys um, down and actually sort of in this area? Uh, so you have uh, approximately, some would say as many as, and I think this is about right, about 2 million Turkish refugees in Lower Turkey, um, or excuse me, Syrian refugees in Lower Turkey. Many of them hiking over crops and going into, um, that would be Erbil or Kurdistan, um, northern Iraq, where Mosul, all of you were following what's going to happen in Iraq, there's going to be the retaking of Mosul. Very complicated because you've got the quasi-autonomous Turkish stand with Erbil and these refugees coming in over here. Erbil, because it's not a government, but Kurdistan is not a government, you can't report how many of uh, refugees it has because officially those kinds of reports would be coming through Iraq. If you go to Erbil, and I do, there, uh, it's, it's huge. And in fact, they are the ones who took in most of the Yazidis and actually went and rescued them. They have a significant number of uh, Christians who came out of Iraq. They have probably as many uh, Sunni Arabs um, as they do uh, Turkmen and others, and then a huge population um, that either walked across uh, northern Syria and over or came up as the fighting uh, advanced through Iraq. Huge, huge, huge problem. And their, their issue is complicated by the fact they're not a sovereign government um, and that they, their wealth actually flows through Iraq um, because they're the oil producer largely and Iraq hasn't paid them for production for over a year. So you've got a humanitarian crisis there looming as well. Wow, this really just looks dire, doesn't it? State conflicts. Syria, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, so we're moving away from the disaster that's crossed the border or the disasters that are crossing the border. Is everybody just like ready to put their eyes on now? Am I boring you? Are you sure? We'll sort of phrase afterwards. Right? Yeah, really. <laughs> I have got to the opportunity first, but I didn't include that slide because I feared it wasn't worth it. If everybody knows about Syria. Uh, everybody knows about Iraq, where we're going with that. Uh, the big problem with Iraq is going to be once one coalition against ISIS wins, there is no good game plan for the inevitable. And that inevitable is going to be who's going to deal with the fact that the Sunna and Al Anbar and the West, who were instrumental to the U.S. success in Iraq, have been persecuted and prosecuted. Uh, in, in, in their view, and I think that's a fairly substantiated claim, by the Shia-driven Baghdad, where we've got a leader that would have to support who's struggling, who arguably has turned over many functions to either Iranian-supported individuals or Iranian-sympathetic individuals, and that just about everybody in the region knows that Mosul cannot be retaken without the support of not only the Iranian-supported militia, um, which those are funded or commanded by either Iranian conventional troops or the IRGC, the uh, Revolutionary Guards that are what they call the asymmetric, sort of the spetsnaz, the soft guys of Iran, as well as the indigenous Shia militia, ones that have evolved out of the Ba'apur or Dada al sadr And so we all take Mosul together. Mosul, which is a mixed city. Mosul, which is critical to uh, the Kurds, as well as the Turkmen and the Arabs. Uh, what's going to happen to Mosul? And will that be a harbinger of the internecine conflicts within Iraq then um, as this whole thing evolves? And then what will Iraq look like um, if that's the case? Um, I don't know. I don't think it's. I, I don't think anyone has dared to try to map it out and get ahead of it because it is so complex. You've got Yemen. We talked a little bit about that. Um, the Houthis, of course, a long-term <coughs> movement. Uh, have they been hijacked, hijacked by the Iranians? I think to the extent that there's a coincidence of interest, probably so. It certainly serves the Saudis and others to overstage the linkage there. Uh, there is an awful lot of evidence that the Iranians supporting them with weaponry. And what's going to happen there? Probably like a state of uh, lack of governance at, I think that's another statement, and 
maybe a country that isn't really a country. Libya, um, you know, we read in the paper every now and then, Libya is going to come out of this. Um, there are indications, I believe, the Tripoli government surrendered, surrendered is not good, agreed to uh, negotiate with the United Nations interface and work with the internationally recognized government. I spent a fair amount of time in Libya, both before Benghazi and after. My personal takeaway on Libya was we missed the most amazing opportunity. Having been there after Gaddafi fell, before Benghazi, and even after, I would walk down the street like this and have, in Misrata, in Benghazi, and in Tripoli, and have random Libyans come up and say, you know, are you from a NATO country? Yes, thank you. We needed this. We want to work with you. Please tell the United States that we need your leadership. Yada, yada. I couldn't, I, mean, I would walk from the hotel in the suit, sit outside and have a cafe. People would come over. The, 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 I'm not trying to sound like Pollyanna here. But, um, you know, even meeting with the Misratans who um, were reluctant, um, there was this expectation that they had um, a unique opportunity in history and that they knew they couldn't do it by themselves and they were begging um, for someone to take them by the hand and help. And we in NATO shamefully dropped the ball in so many ways I think we were um, and, and I can't tell you how even after Benghazi you, know, you would walk into the airport and do your thing and every living who came in contact with you um, would apologize. Just apologize. Now, I was also in the hotel that was taken over by my mother brotherhood um, for them to have a meeting about how to take over the government, which was living in the same hotel I was in. Um, and there, there were some scary things. But people were, everyone was energized in how they could better themselves or take over the government and have it themselves. And that's just reality, and, but we missed an opportunity. Whether it was that good guys that bad guys, it's a shame. Nuclear Middle East. Why do we care if Iran gets the nuclear weapon and uh, nuclear capable missiles. Well, of course, it's a threat to the United States. More importantly, it's the threat to hundreds of thousands of U.S. personnel assigned to the Middle East. As we, as we talk today, we've got men, women, diplomats, intelligence officers, uniformed and ununiformed who are in the Middle East, uh, who are well-known targets of opportunity. And more importantly, because uh, it's very clear that Saudi Arabia, at a minimum, Turkey's talked about it, I'd be surprised. Um, will Egypt get a nuclear weapon? They can't afford it, but they might if somebody else paid for it. But the idea of the Middle East, which is such a small little place, of having a weapons race, and the weapons race is already going on. I, I'm a weapons broker. Uh, I can tell you business is good. So the weapon race has already started. Uh, whether it's going to be a nuclear weapons race um, is really a problem for all of us. Um, even if you just are going to talk about the environmental okay. catastrophes that could occur. Um, GCC internally united or divided? Don't know. It's not the most unified of organizations, although I was the ASD for NATO, and when we had old NATO and new NATO, as uh, Secretary Brunson would say, some would say it wasn't the most organized um, for, for unity of thought organization as well, so I tend to be a little bit less critical. And um, weaknesses or strengths. Um, it's a dangerous mix, and that is, is the problem a lot of the times. When there's a mix of weaknesses and strengths in, a, in an area that's so volatile with so many differences, um, it ends up being a challenge for them, but it's also a challenge to U.S. interests. Here's the proliferation slide. Um, it's not just the proliferation, of course, of uh, nuclear material, but um, other weapons of mass destruction, uh, chemical, biological. Uh, I think everybody sort of skated past in Syria the documented use, at least by one side, if not both, of uh, mustard gas and possible sarin gas. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that and possible uses of the evolved out of what's going on in Iraq. So called the Lobby State. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because I get the terrorist financing for just one moment. If you think about it, the, the diet issue, is a fairly new organization. If you were doing a corporate study, this would be something spending some time. Uh, just declared its uh, genesis in 2014. Uh, of course, many of the founding members um, from Iraq, long-term, well-known guys, 
who have held um, either extremist views or power power positions in previous ter uh, terms of the uh, terms of Dr. Al Baghdadi, the Caliph of all Muslims. They are a, they are an organization that's based upon uniquely the idea that they will restore the caliphate, uh, physical control of a state on a geographic basis. So that's where ISIL, Islamic State in the Levant, uh, Levant because it, from an English standpoint, that's what we sort of think of the, of the Levant, the Great Syria is another way to think of it. Um, so that is, um, that's the Islamic State, Sunni base, they're Salafis, of course, um, and they, um, Sort of their their shit is uh, in order to be pure and to bring about um, the what should be brought about under the tenets of Islam that we must return to the religious, military, and cultural values of, um, of the days of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, unlike AQ, uh, AQ more flexible, operates geographically, um, has sort of corporate infrastructure. You got the finance guy, you got the You've got the letter writing guy, you've got the emissary for Al Qaeda, you've got uh, Osama bin Laden reviewing tapes, doing research into uh, US press, et cetera, et cetera. IS, IS is caliphate, a total allegiance is required. You can't really sort of just be part of this at all and brought on, although there's an awful lot of claimed affiliations with ISIS that I don't think anybody knows yet how they actually link into the so called core. And if there is a so called core, or whether at a certain point people can operate moderately independently within a network like sort of the European groups. And whether, you know, are, are they plugged into the guys in Syria? I, I don't think that's been totally determined. Fierce opponents of, uh, <coughs> of, um, of Shia and um, proponents of Sunni Islam. That is uh, Daesh, traditionally that's the caliphate. Um, here are the countries that are operating in uh, one aspect or another, probably the largest coalition of uh, operations uh, in the world. It's interesting, there's a new map out by, um, by Daesh that shows the caliphate, the traditional homeland, but also shows some of the provinces like um, Kasporistan or whatever it is, it's now the Egyptian province or, or whatever they want to call it. There's a new province now in Europe. Uh, so it sort of shows the, the sort of the B class of where they'll be operating. My, my um, PowerPoint skills were not good enough to get that for you today. And how is IS supported? Uh, big debate right now. Um, very early on, uh, there were two primary sources of funding, and I'm going to talk about funding, not other kinds of support, that IS used or Daesh. And the first um, and foremost was um, oil and gas. Uh, that they had actually taken over uh, some of the refineries, some of the transportation nodes, um, some of the extraction, and were siphoning it off and shipping actually the, the oil through Turkey, which is one of the reasons why Turkey sort of got a bit of a bloody nose from the beginning. Um, this has actually been uh, changed, we believe. And in fact, uh, about three or four months ago, uh, there was a, a uh, fairly well known, I think it came out in the press as well. Uh, reduction of pay for foreign fighters that they believe was part of the low price of gas and oil um, problem that the caliphate was having. Um, and then more recently, uh, there's a publicly available document that's found in, in one of the caches that basically talked about uh, if, if you're an ISIS enclave in this place or the other place, you need to rely on your own uh, resources available to you. So it's whether it's taxation, whether it's selling antiquities that you have available, whether it's uh, seizing businesses, you need to be largely self-sustaining. Uh, you will not be getting uh, funding from uh, the mothership. And uh, there's a lot of talk about that being A, as a result of the price of oil and gas, uh, oil principally buying so low. And secondly, uh, some of the, the strikes, a lot of the US strikes and others have done a lot to um, that target big convoys of ISIS, either uh, materials or people, or uh, they've actually blown up, very, very public blowing up of a cash, um, of a dollar, you know, dollar bills or whatever it's for the years. They've really gone after the resources successfully. Uh, second, charities still have a lot of donations coming from not the Gulf states, but individuals within the Gulf states. 
Some of these are uh, extremists or uh, Wahhabists or uh, Salafis who actually buy into the core belief um, that Daesh is fundamental to um, the returning to the prophets, the type of prophets and the principles of the prophet and bringing about um, the type of Islam that will um, foreshadow the end of the world. Uh, a lot of them, uh, particularly in the Gulf, we spend a lot of time with them, are thinly disguised uh, charitable organizations designed to help uh, Syrian refugees or Iraqi refugees or potable water projects, et cetera, et cetera, that ultimately are actually ISIS friends. Um, they have done an amazing job, um, by far better than Al-Qaeda, in um, their internet usage. They've got all kinds of charities uh, and uh, recruiting members or things um, to uh, plug into on the internet and actually receive a lot of donations that way. Um, some of them overtly for uh, poor uh, Islam, others that are, again, uh, foundations or allegedly um, philanthropic type organizations that we're talking about. Um, they have tremendous access to bank money and monetary instruments. They, they absolutely windfall um, with Mosul. Um, as far as cash and uh, some would say gold, they probably burned through that, but it's one of the first things they do when they come into a territory is to, um, basically take all the cash or monetary instruments or anything of value, okay, including jewelry. Um, uh, taxes, uh, this actually gets to the um, sort of the local aspect of it more and more. They're taxing the local population. You can be taxed as a woman for not being appropriately dressed. You can be taxed for not having your beard long enough. You can be taxed for yada, yada, yada. Um, this actually is having a little bit of a boomerang effect in that some of the local populations now are terribly upset with what they see to be a, um, at least ostensibly, Islamic, philanthropic, fundamentalist organization that is now taxing with them and penalizing them for not being ISIS in particular um, and basically profiting from it. Uh, interestingly, the taxes, um, on the one hand, people will say that the biggest vulnerability of ISIS is they have to control land in order for their story for, about the caliphate to work. Um, and if they don't control land, uh, it, it appears as though they're weakening. Some would argue that's why they're doing more spectacular European and other beyond the caliphate uh, demonstrations of their continuing power if they, if they start sliding back on their ability to territory. But it does allow them to tax. And then uh, some of the more, uh, actually the growing would be the theft the sale of antiquity state properties um, and local sources. I thought this was interesting. So where are ISIS supporters tweeting from? And this will give you a, a, a tweeting from. This will give you a sense of how incredibly, in that, uh, not in that, how incredibly adept they have been using the internet. Fourth largest in the United States source of tweets in support of the Muslim Brotherhood along the lines of resources. Um, um, and that's from the working Institute. too. There's actually like, a couple more scary ones that could have been The way ahead. If we haven't been serious about our national security um, beyond our own borders, um, I think it's pretty indicative that this presidential election people are talking more about foreign policy than others had anticipated, we need to start getting clear about it. And uh, first and foremost, I think it involves a conversation with the American people about what are U.S. interests in all these places. I mean, if the rest of the world is going crazy and, and going down the tube quickly, um, you know, maybe we ought to step back for a second and, and figure out what is it that really is our national interest in any of our, or all of these, and then designing a strategy to address those threats. Um, many people will argue this is where we fall down, um, that all of the stuff is arguably related and interwoven, and our strategies tend to deal with a, a, a umbrella upon which we formulate activities to deal with a certain problem. And then as that problem morphs or there are unintended consequences for as it as it starts linking to other national security interests in the United States. We deal with that later. We've got to have a strategy, and um, I would say a moment to be critical of this administration in that I think 
one of the things that you will hear from uh, the military and other national security leaders is we, if we've had a foreign policy strategy or strategies, they've been opaque. Um, and if they're opaque and you can't explain them to your allies, you can be pretty clear that your enemies uh, sense that vulnerability and will exploit it. Once you have your strategy, once you figure out what it is you need, what, what, what is it you're going to care about, and what is it you want to do, you need to have the capabilities to do them. Um, or don't do them. Um, and the capabilities can mean both military and diplomatic, they mean um, having the relationships in place, they mean having um, uh, the USAID and the diplomatic and intelligence resources in place, they mean taking a careful look at what this is going to do to your trade relations, your trade routes, and your balance of, of uh, your, your precious coin. If there are unforeseen repercussions and China gets mad at you, for example, if you decide you're going to act on what's happening in this tough China Sea, all of this has to be part of your strategy. You're, 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 everybody says it, but nobody has really figured out what the whole of government strategy is. But unfortunately, what we find out after the fact is it, it was neither whole um, nor totally governmental. And We've got to get better about this because, again, the barriers to entry to to actually have significant negative impact on the U.S. are just getting smaller and smaller. And then we need to execute, and credibility counts. Um, right now, in, in my mind, um, I think certainly in the Middle East we have a huge credibility deficit, um, which the, the next president, who he or she may be, or is going to have to deal with. Um, and there's a huge vacuum there that we may not be trusted again to fill whether we want to or not. But it's very difficult to shape people and events and to persuade them to do what you want them to do if you don't have a relationship with them, if you haven't bothered to be nice to them and what they view are coming, coming from you to be constant criticism. Um, and you can't ask them to leverage um, and to do things with you if they basically correctly so assume that it's only your interest and that your interest don't belong. Um, one of the problems we're going to have a hard time ever getting over is the, at least the Sunni Arabs believing that we all along we're going to elevate our relationship with Iran and that's not going to change. That's a fundamental difference. A sea change of generations with the U.S. And there will be skepticism um, along those lines for a very long time um, by the individuals. They just couldn't believe it. Now, whether it's true or not, really doesn't matter. It goes to your credibility, and it goes to your ability to shape the So, I know I bored like half of you. I should have made you all get up and do jumping jacks because it's after lunch. But thanks for your attention and uh, any questions.